Mr. Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the premises of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. It's really a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here with, uh, to this very important discussion this morning. We are hosting this uh, meeting and seminar today, but it's uh, co-organized with uh, our colleagues here. Minister of Interior, CMI and uh, CMC, Crisis Management Center. And you know that CMI was founded by President Ahtisar 14 years ago. Our crisis management center is a center of excellence, uh, really, uh, when compared to many European countries. We really want to think that we are a big power in civilian crisis management. Our theme today is a complex one, but it's a very relevant one the status of peacemaking in African diplomacy, lessons from responding to crises. And I think really we ha have to underline and put emphasis on the word lessons. What can we learn? What can we do better in the future? Africa and African conflicts have been regularly on our agenda and of course uh, also on the agenda of the EU. And we are we really have been trying to contribute to those uh, forces aiming at building peace and resolving conflicts. We have contributed to both military and civilian crisis management operations and also used our development cooperation as a tool for uh, contributing to sustainable peace. Also, the concept of mediation is very important to us. Uh, you may, for example, know that Finland and Turkey together have initiated an informal group called Friends of Mediation. We have been sponsoring uh, United Nations uh, resolution on mediation uh, and st strongly supporting, for example, impunity, uh, fight against impunity and uh, working for uh, enhancing rule of law. And of course, the resolution on 1325 has been a priority to us, as in more general terms, uh, the role of women in peace building and mediation. So, without further ado, I would like to invite my colleague Antti Heikio to continue with welcoming words. Dear Mr. Minister, Madam uh, Under Secretary of State, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in 19 70s, we used to be excellent in the long distance running. The Finnish runners in Olympic Games, they won, won gold medals. And as a result of that, half of the nation started thinking that we are indeed good in long distance running. Finland runs, Suomi Juokse was created that time. 1980s and <coughs> 90s, the Finnish guys actually started succeeding in the formula, formula driving. As a result of that, we again were thinking that we are excellent drivers and the young people even nowadays crash their cars into the trees in the Finnish summer nights. Martti Ahtisari got the peace noble. And somehow as a result of that, we started thinking that the nation is excellent in peace mediation. I don't think that's the case. There's a lot of, lot of learning. We have to develop and systematically develop our skills and knowledge in the peace mediation. It's not something that a nation has as a character or anyone has as a character. European Union currently has a staff of 5,000 people in what we call crisis management both military and civilian crisis management activities. <coughs> in comparison to the United Nations having 100,000 peacekeepers, people working in the peace building, peace building activities, there's a difference. Africa and African Union have maybe been able to create some better practices, better practices than the political organization or structures or institutions of the European Union, and there's a lot of things we need to learn from Africa, African Union and the African best practices. 
Ministry of Interior in Finland is responsible for implementation of those decisions, what our good colleagues in the foreign ministry make on the Finnish participation. For this implementation as an operational actor, we have founded Crisis Management Center in the Eastern Finland, but working actively here in the capital region in Europe and, and all over the world. We are indeed encouraging our operational state actor as CMC Finland also actively cooperate with the non-governmental and the civil society sector. And I think this, this event here is an excellent, excellent example of that, how the state actors also need to engage with the civil society and the non-governmental non actors. And I'm happy to, to, happy to ask uh, uh, head of our research and development, Päivi Kuosmanen, to continue on the behalf of the Crisis Management Center. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Minister, Madam Under Secretary of State, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to see you all here. And on behalf of Crisis Management Center Finland, CMC Finland, I welcome you all to the seminar. I thank the Crisis Management Initiative and the Africa team arranging the seminar today with CMC Finland. And I also thank the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Ministry of the Interior on the support to arrange and hosting the seminar. As I said, I am very de delighted to see you all here. So many of you are present. Another aspect that I'm very pleased today is the fact that the seminar is a continuation to a seminar, inclusive mediation, lessons from supporting national and regional actors in Africa that CMC Finland arranged together with CMI in this year in March in the House of Estates. The seminar in March also showed strong interest in Finland towards peace mediation and the work of CMI's Africa team. The interest is in line with Finland's goals to give considerable input to peace mediation. This is also declared in Finland's national strategy for civilian crisis management that was updated this year. In the strategy, it is stated that Finland aims to participate in crisis management in a comprehensive manner and which takes into account Finland's forties. Finland underscores the need for cooperation and coordination between different instruments such as civilian and military crisis management, development cooperation, humanitarian assistance, diplomacy, economic relations and sanctions, and mediation. Accordingly, mediation is an activity that CMC Finland is keen to support. Furthermore, mediation has generally had or is still having a strong input to the regions where the Finnish civilian crisis management experts work in the missions. And here you can see the map um, on the regions where the missions have taken place. And as we notice from the regions, they are the same where mediation has been part of present history and one should be aware of mediation's influence and achieved goals. As an advocate um, of civilian crisis management activities, third aspect why I'm very pleased to have the seminar today is that we'll soon hear the best practices and lessons learned in mediation. After all, Finland's national strategy for civilian crisis management also emphasizes the need to strengthen effectiveness in activities. And in this, sharing lessons learned is the cruise. Without sharing information and learning from it, the crisis management cannot find the best practices as efficiently as needed and wanted. Therefore, I now want to give the stage for CMI and Africa team 
and led them to give us all the opportunity to hear their notions on their challenges and success in their work in mediation. This supports us all to work in conflict regions towards more peaceful period and peace. So therefore, once again, welcome to the seminar and welcome to Yatalvitie and CMI and Africa team. I wish you all the most inspiring seminar. Thank you very much, Minister, Under Secretary of State, Excellencies, friends and colleagues. On behalf of CMI, warm thanks um, to the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, to CMC Finland for organizing the seminar jointly together with CMI. I would like to express my particular thanks to the MFA as a strong supporter and an important partner of CMI. At CMI, we're very grateful for our partnership and firmly believe that it strengthens our joint efforts for the peaceful resolution of conflicts. Today's seminar is very timely. We are living in the worst times since the Second World War in terms of simultaneous, mostly man-made crises, writes Foreign Policy magazine. The number and scale of humanitarian crises is at a record high with Iraq, South Sudan, Syria, the Central African Republic topping the list. Where does that leave us as conflict resolution professionals? The topic of today's seminar is the status of peacemaking in African diplomacy, lessons from responding to crises. Over the past decade, CMI has systematically strengthened its presence in Africa, where we have developed comprehensive country programs like in South Sudan and established strong partnerships with regional and sub-regional organizations. Our core principles of ensuring strong local ownership and engagement and tirelessly seeking practical solutions in cooperation with others are also reflected in our work in Africa. One of our key partnerships in Africa is with the African Union. The AU and CMI have been official partners since 2009 when together with Accord and the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs we established the Joint African Union Mediation Support Capacities Project with the goal of building the AU's capacities to prevent and respond to crises on the continent through effective mediation. Over the years, this tripartite initiative has evolved to meet the particular challenges of the changing peace and security context in Africa, and CMI's role has become more operational and hands-on. Only last week, CMI, Accord, and the AU's Peace and Security Department gathered here in Helsinki to review the joint initiative and to plan key pillars for future cooperation. In our review of the project, it became clear that private diplomacy actors like CMI and Accord are very necessary to support and complement the work of the AU. For example, as we will hear uh, during today's panel discussion, CMI has recently been able to provide crucial support to the AU's and the ECOSIS mediation efforts in the Central African Republic. At CMI, we look forward to continuing our staunch support to peace processes in Africa, and as the demand for credible and acceptable actors in peacemaking continues to grow, we have made deliberate effort to focus on strengthening and broadening our level of responsiveness. The presence of our, uh, of our esteemed senior advisors here today is the reflection of that continued effort to, to solidify our capacity to respond to situations where we and our partners, such as the African Union, see a meaningful role for CMI. Therefore, allow me to introduce to you Mr. Itonde Kakoma, who has headed CMI's Sub-Saharan Africa team since the beginning of May this year, and we'll introduce the panelists and moderate today's discussion. With significant experience in mediation, transitional justice, and reconciliation processes, Itonde has previously served as the Assistant Director for Africa in the Conflict Resolution Program of the Carter Center. Based in Arusha, Tanzania, Itonde is a strong asset to CMI, and on behalf of CMI, I wish you all welcome to today's mini-seminar 
and I'm now delighted to hand over to Itonde. Tuya, thank you for the very warm welcome and to colleagues here at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Internal Internal Affairs as well as CMC, thank you very much uh, for your hospitality. I will be brief in the introductions uh, as you all have more elaborate descriptions in uh, the, the program, I believe, uh, and we also don't want to take too much time away from the discussion itself. Uh, to my left, Ambassador Nicolas Boakira, who serves also as a senior advisor to CMI's Africa program. Uh, most recently in an official capacity serving as the African Union Special Envoy to Somalia, that coming after a very long and distinguished career with the UN, in particular as the head for the Africa Department in which capacity oversaw numerous critical uh, reintegration crises uh, facing the continent, not least of which being uh, Namibia, uh, where in fact he worked with President Atazari on that team uh, in, in resolution of uh, the Namibian uh, crisis. Um, Ambassador David Kapia of Tanzania, uh, a distinguished uh, indeed former colleague and now current colleague with Ambassador Boakira at UNHCR, also serving in the Africa Department there uh, as a rep representative for UNHCR on, on, on numerous missions, uh, not least of which uh, being uh, the DRC, uh, Sudan, etc., uh, but also uh, serving as a special envoy for former President Nkapa, uh, still working on his behalf in the office of former President Nkapa as a special envoy to DRC, where he supported the recent efforts at peacemaking in Eastern DRC, and continues uh, to serve on the technical committee uh, with former President uh, Mary Robinson uh, on, on, the, on the Eastern DRC process. Uh, Ambassador Nuraldine Sati of Sudan, uh, a distinguished uh, long UN uh, career diplomat, not only uh, with uh, UNESCO serving as uh, cluster, head of cluster offices in Addis Ababa, also in Nairobi, uh, engaged in numerous peace processes, uh, prior to which he was in the foreign ministry with, uh, of Sudan. Uh, and I would highlight also uh, distinguished parts of his career uh, as, as appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations as, as Deputy SRSG in Burundi, uh, in particular, but of, of numerous other accomplishments. And I would further highlight him still serving as chair of the UNESCO Peace Fund. Uh, to my right, uh, Colonel Mbai Fai, most recently prior to joining CMI as a senior security arrangements advisor to the mediation uh, support unit, or standby team of the Department for Political Affairs at the United Nations, uh, prior to which uh, he served for nearly a decade in one particular context of Burundi, where he was, I would almost say single-handedly, but he would differ, uh, drafted and assisted, if not uh, uh, cared for, the implementation of the ceasefire arrangements and related security arrangements in Burundi. And, and there I would highlight the emphasis on transition from rebel movement into political organization, and, and this er being an area of specialization for him. Prior to the United Nations, uh, he served in various command positions uh, for Senegal uh, in, the, in the army. Uh, I would highlight there as chief of staff uh, for, for Senegal. George Charpentier, who is a son of Finland, uh, and arguably a son of, of, of the United Nations as well, if I may say. Uh, just finishing a, a three-decade career uh, most recently as the deputy SRSG in the Central African Republic, uh, prior to which serving in various uh, coordination capacity or overseeing various UN operations from Sudan uh, to Libya and Burundi. Shall I continue? <laughs> Collectively, I think uh, here at this table there is a wealth of, of knowledge uh, and lessons to be gained and and, and summarize. Uh, so we're very, very thankful for the opportunity to do this as a preliminary part of that ongoing process. I would re be remiss if I did not recognize two of several colleagues who are present with us. Uh, Marwan, who is the head of our uh, North Africa and Sahel team, and Mariama Conte, who is 
uh, an advisor on multi-dialogue uh, processes. Colleagues from CNI, forgive me for not naming you individually, but I in particular wanted to highlight those two individuals who I hope will contribute to ongoing discussion. Without further ado, allow me to, with all humility, <laughs> invite uh, Minister Pekka Harvesto, Minister for International Development here in Finland, uh, to say a further word uh, on behalf of the government of Finland. Thank you, sir. So, Excellencies, Honorable Elizabeth Rehn, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, and, and colleagues from CMI and the ministries, it's a pleasure for me to be here today, and I don't want to steal too much time from the panel. I think we have excellent uh, combination here, and I was particularly pleased to see Mr. Bakir. I think we have mm -hmm. been uh, having endless hours in some hotel rooms in Addis Ababa <laughs> discussing the Somalia, <laughs> Somalia conflict. Uh, and I, I think there's some, still something to be discussed in that conflict as well as, as, as others, but also other, other familiar faces. and, and, and uh, 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 great expertise on, on African issues. I recall actually the five years ago uh, meeting in Addis Abeba when, when, when CMI, ACCORD, African Union were discussing about the cooperation of supporting the African Union uh, uh, peace building uh, capabilities and, and uh, I think that was some kind of turning point that instead of uh, trying to arrange the African affairs from outside giving particularly support to the African mediators and, and African peace facilities and, and, and giving that support. And I think this is exactly what CMI has been doing and what the Finnish government has been supporting through CMI, through ACCORD and, and so on. And I'm very happy to see actually some of the results that we have more and more African peace mediators. We have more and more knowledge on, on the African conflicts also. And African Union has been coming more and uh, stronger and stronger playing player uh, in this ground. When uh, Mr. Antti Heikki, uh, mentioned that very things are good that I immediately was thinking that uh, earlier, at least in the sports, we were saying that we are good at everything where you need a helmet. You know, ice hockey, <laughs> ski jumping, <laughs> rally driving, or formula. And uh, I don't know why is that. And, and maybe also earlier, when you when you look at the Finns and the peace, it was the peacekeepers with the <laughs> helmet that were, were used. But nowadays we have more and more mediators without helmets, but uh, <laughs> maybe you need some kind of spiritual helmet on you when you are enter into this crisis, but I think our uh, crisis management has really made a long step uh, from the peacekeeping to the civilian uh, crisis management issues, but also on the mediation issues. And I, I think now we, I, I feel that we have the whole repertoire on the issues that are, are needed. And last but not least, of course, the, the defending of the victims, which uh, Madame Rehn is doing very effectively mm -hmm. in the context mm -hmm. of the ICC and, and others. And this, this uh, side of the story, I think, nowadays is more and more important. We actually uh, have been discussing quite a lot in, here in Finland that we, we see some kind of destruction on the humanitarian law going uh, on all over. You look at the Central African Republic, what's going on there. Of course, the, the other conflicts, like the Somalia conflict also, the humanitarian law was very often forgotten. But now when you look at the, the actions of the ISIS in, in Syria, Iraq, when you look what happened in Gaza, bombing of the, the schools, but you look to what happened to the uh, 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 prisoners of war in, in Ukraine, they were humiliated publicly and, and so on. So on. And actually, all these rules were established last century or 18th century and, and uh, with the Red Cross and, and, and so on. And, and we see still today a very serious uh, breaking of these rules. And I think we are, we are responsible for raising our voices that what are the rules of the conflict? There are rules for the warfare. And, and those who are broke, breaking these rules, they will be responsible for that. And I, I, I think we have uh, also, when we look internationally, we see the, the uh, uh, process in Sri Lanka, what happened when the Tamilis were, were, were uh, in, the, in the final moment, uh, also the civilians were, were attacked. We see what happened in Cambodia. Again, uh, things are now processed uh, uh, legally. And I think the very, very same message we have to have to Central African Republic, to Iraq, Syria, and, and, and uh, even to the, to the Middle East, those who are responsible for the atrocities finally have to face the, the, the legal process. I think we uh, also um, 
I think it's fair to say that we don't have only bad news from Africa. And I think it's very important when we are discussing about our picture on Africa. There are many countries that have a excellent economic growth, countries that are peaceful, countries that are, are growing very rapidly, and I think we are somehow lacking behind also on our picture of, of Africa many ways here in Finland. I had a, some weeks ago a visit to China, and, and we usually always be a little bit uh, critical or jealous of what we are to China, that they are investing so much to Africa. And I'm always saying that uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't ask why China is active in Africa, we should ask why we are not active in Africa. And actually it was very interesting to discuss with the Chinese government, who, who they directly proposed for Finland a tripartite cooperation. If you are interested, please join us. Let's make uh, renewable technologies, let, let's make solar panels, let's make uh, 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 wind generators and, and others for, for Africa. If you are interested, we are already there, we are doing this project, please jump, jump to the wagon. And I, I think that was quite an attractive, uh, uh, attractive point. It, it was funny, by the way, that in Shanghai, because we are so happy and, and proud of our clean tech and, and our uh, good environmental friendly technologies. When I mentioned the clean tech uh, in Shanghai, they said, yes, how much you want? We can give you all <laughs> that we have been developing it there. So we are, we are a little bit uh, sometimes uh, thinking that we have a monopole, but in many countries these technologies are, are developing. So let me just uh, 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 conclude with, with one idea, since I have been following Sudan, and I'm happy that Ambassador from Sudan is, is here. Um, we have many forgotten conflicts. Actually, conflicts are sometimes on the, on the uh, uh, front pages or in, the, in the news. Uh, I think Darfur, which I worked with, was one time the conflict of the world. All the Hollywood stars were around that conflict. And, and uh, I think both sides, the government and the rebels, somehow were feeling that, well, we have the conflict. This is the conflict of the world, and, and so on. And we were always warning them, you know, there will be a day that the world will forget you. If you don't make the peace now, the momentum has gone, there's no newspaper topics anymore, and, and other conflicts will come. And this is, by the way, exactly where we are. Who remembers these days what's going on in Darfur or in, uh, in the border of the Sudans and others when we are reading about the Gaza or when we are reading about the ISIS and so on. But I think this also gives us an opportunity. Let's work on these forgotten conflicts or conflicts that are not on the front page at this moment. And, and let's talk sense to the parties saying, well, yes, the, the caravan has gone further from your conflict, but maybe it's time for you to sit at the table and, and, and discuss. And I think this is related to the Central African Republic and, and others where a lot of uh, tasks need to be done, even if these conflicts are not as sexy as Ukraine or Gaza or, or uh, Syria, Iraq today. I wish with these words you a very good seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Indeed. Somehow we managed to be ahead of schedule, uh, and we will use uh, those additional minutes judiciously. Uh, we'll turn now to the panel and, and hear two initial reflections, uh, one from Georges Charpentier, no preference because of Finnish origin there, uh, <laughs> starting us, and, and two from Ambassador Nicola Bwakira. Uh, to lead us in uh, our initial reflections, from which we will delve into more specificity. And here I would highlight a couple of things. We do not take it for granted whatsoever as CMI that we are partnering formally with the African Union. This is a rare and precious thing which we will continue to nurture. And as a result of that cooperation, we are invited by request to be engaged operationally in some of the most pressing issues facing not only the African continent, but the globe. Two of those being the Central African Republic and South Sudan. Uh, and two of our colleagues uh, will be departing from here tomorrow to advance that cooperation within the framework of the ministry's support uh, to CMI and Accord and the African Union. That being said, we, we turn to uh, Georges and, and Ambassador Bwakira for some initial reflections. Before you do, Minister Harvesto, you mentioned something that has been troubling me a bit, namely uh, neglected uh, conflicts. And I know that there is an entire initiative and funding mechanism globally around neglected tropical diseases. 
I wonder why there isn't the same level of attentiveness to neglected conflicts that continue to brew. Arguably, some of the areas in which we work at CMI will focus on those neglected conflicts specifically. George, I turn to you for some initial reflections, if you would, please. Yes, thank you. And thank you all, really, for these uh, inspiring uh, comments made at the, right at the opening. I think a lot of things were said. And I want to take, um, quickly mention two or three points to uh, provoke a little bit the, the discussion. And one came up already in the initial uh, discussion, initial presentation, and that's uh, Finland's role in, uh, in mediation in, in, in Africa. And, and I would say, uh, having uh, evolved in Africa for the last 30 years, uh, I have clearly seen in the last 10 years um, a, a, a loss of confidence by political players, um, uh, in the, let's say, big powers, you know, the, G, the G5 Security Council members um, and the international institutions, even regional institutions, uh, to resolve uh, crises. I mean, that, that, that um, trend is, is clear, and it clearly opens up uh, the door to uh, um, less uh, politically, let's say, uh, uh, labeled or involved uh, uh, or more neutral uh, players. And Finland is definitely seen as a neutral uh, player in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, I, I, I think there, uh, when, when, when you are working on mediation in, on the ground, it's really more about building trust uh, among uh, key players uh, than in, in, in uh, ensuring, uh, let's say, the political aura of the mediation process. Uh, it has become more important to uh, work on that uh, trust and, and create commitment and, and engagement from that trust than to ensure, for example, that the, 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 the P5 of the Security Council are involved, uh, that they are uh, 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 engaged and, and so on. So there I would say my personal experience is indeed Finland is known, well respected uh, in Africa and CMI is less well known, but uh, uh, definitely um, getting more and more uh, known and, 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 and trusted. Um, <clears throat> this leads me to a point that we have recently worked on, uh, which is the follow-up, the other point, uh, follow-up to the peace agreements and, um, uh, in Africa. Uh, there is um, a lot of examples of signed peace agreements, cessation of hostilities, most recently the one in, in Central African Republic where we were together in Arusha and uh, uh, realized very clearly that, that um, uh, well, we, we will get them to sign something, uh, or we got them to sign something, we, we met there afterwards, but what kind of in inclusivity and representativity was there in Brazzaville to ensure that the, that the ceasefire will actually be implemented. And no later than 48 hours after the Seleka uh, branch that was not in Brazzaville uh, provoked some incidents and put that whole process of ceasefire in, in, uh, in question. Um, so there needs to be, uh, as part of the engagement that we are um, uh, providing, a, th a more thorough follow-up to uh, mediation processes and, and, and peace uh, agreements. Arusha in Burundi is a very good example. It has worked on certain aspects. The security sector, which uh, Colonel Fai knows very well, Protocol 3 of the Arusha Peace Accord has, let's say, worked uh, in the balance of power between Tutsis and Hutus. 
But for example, the, ho the whole part of the Protocol 1, which t go, uh, talks about reconciliation and justice, um, has not been implemented almost at all. And um, uh, when we were recently in, in, uh, in Burundi, uh, uh, we got it from several places, from different, different uh, parts, that um, it's important to review in depth the Arusha Peace Accord and to uh, draw uh, its conclusions and see how to move ahead from, uh, from there. Uh, again, we, we talked about um, peace processes. Uh, we have to move away from looking at the democratic process as a, as a blueprint. You know, you get the, the parties to sign an agreement and then you have to start working on the constitution or start preparing elections and um, there is a, 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 a sequencing that has become too much of a, of a blueprint and we very very often think that um, elections is, is almost the solution or almost the end part of the uh, transition. We, we very often consider that elections is uh, the end of a transition. And, uh, and um, that is definitely a mistake because uh, in, in many countries, take Central African Republic, uh, Burundi, uh, and uh, in Cote d'Ivoire during the elections, it's, it's not about agreeing on an electoral process, uh, on a democratic process. It's, it's really uh, the, the, the state of mind of the political players, whether they are ready or not, to compromise, to share power, and to move into a, 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 a process for the country in the future where um, political, I mean, political and security power is actually shared and needs to be managed in a in a democratic uh, uh, way. So this is this requires much more work, follow up, and in that work than organizing an, an electoral uh, process uh, also. Finally, and I know you are... Um, <laughs> <laughs> continue, continue. Yeah. Well, very quickly, I will say that the, the, the socioeconomic uh, aspects uh, uh, are very often kept out of the political security mediation uh, mm. process. This is also, in my view, uh, a mistake. Uh, if people um, engage into rebellious uh, activities, uh, very often it's more because the, the, they lack opportunities for better jobs, they lack, uh, uh, yes, opportunities for a better livelihood, <coughs> rather than their conviction that this party is better than the other party and they should join uh, to, to, to gain. Uh, and, 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 and the international community has, has had more of a of a, a, a curative approach to uh, uh, a, a, you know a, a direct um, approach to to the, these socioeconomic aspects uh, than a long-term uh, approach. The Sahel is a very good example. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, not much in terms of development uh, uh, has occurred in the Sahel. If you look at Mali, Mauritania, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger. Uh, uh, the amount of development these countries have achieved in the last 10 years is, is not very uh, uh, impressive. So uh, there, there, there should there also, uh, this is my point of, of reflection, uh, be a change of approach in, in supporting that socioeconomic development <coughs> where the international community provides investment and support to create the conditions for a homegrown development rather than injecting uh, money uh, through projects uh, and so on. That means, for example, very quickly, uh, 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 the EU agreeing on lifting subsidies on uh, uh, agricultural produce that is being produced in Mali or Cote d'Ivoire and so on, giving them uh, uh, a priority over 10, 15 years 
to enter and Absolutely. access the market and create the dynamics of development through that rather than through uh, bilateral aid or humanitarian uh, support. I will stop there. No, thank you. Georges, you, you, you promised to be provocative, and indeed, I think you, you provoked particularly on the questions surrounding elections and the blueprint around democratic processes. Uh, this is a sensitive subject, of course, uh, and, and one that was highlighted by uh, Madam Undersecretary here as a priority in terms of supporting rule of law, democratic processes, obviously in line with the contextual realities. Ambassador Sati, I believe he touched on a, a, a sensitive spot for you, given that in your capacity as a, a representative of the Secretary General in Burundi, you were responsible for organizing the elections itself. So hopefully in the discussion we can get on, uh, on into this discussion. Ambassador Bwakira, I turn to you for initial reflections as before turning to all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tonde. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I'm very pleased to be in Helsinki. Uh, this is my first visit to Finland. Hmm. Although I've been uh, in the other Nordic countries, this is my really first visit. And not the last. We say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but more importantly, I would like to emphasize that uh, there is a, a soft spot in Africa for Nordic countries because of the history, history of supporting liberation movement and lack of colonial baggage. Uh, I remember uh, in 1989 um, in Namibia when UNHCR as part of a UN arrangement for the process of independence to Namibia, of Namibia. We organized fundraising for the, our operations. In three days, uh, the funds were um, mobilizing uh, about 36 million, were uh, fully funded thanks to the Nordic countries. Uh, so I would like to say that uh, it is very important that Finland among Nordic countries continue to play a role, particularly in the area of mediation and conflict management. Now, this having been said, uh, let me uh, just say that uh, in my experience dealing with conflict, while, as George said, there is a diminishing trust and confidence in a big organization like United Nations. There is also another phenomenon, which is lack of trust um, of parties in conflict to countries surrounding mm. the region. Mm. And to have in mind uh, Somalia. Um, when in uh, 2005-2006, the African Union wanted to send the troops to Somalia to support the institutions. Uh, there was a resolution forbidding surrounding countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, of sending troops to Somalia because of the suspicion and his historical conflict between, for instance, Somalia and Ethiopia. And in fact, in 2008, when we met in Djibouti, discussing with the different parties to the conflict, we specifically recommended that Ethiopia withdraws troops from Somalia because the presence of troops in Somalia was like a mobilizing factor for Shabab against all foreign troops. To the contrary, UN was trusted, AU was trusted. So different situation, different models. Uh, this underlines the complexity of conflict. I, would, I will then go further to say that uh, 
in a crisis like Central African Republic, one has to look at the role of neighboring countries. What is the role of Chad vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Congo Brazzaville? Um, so uh, what is the influence of these countries vis-a-vis -vis of uh, parties to the conflict, uh, the mistrust of neighbors, uh, neighbors who come with uh, interest, therefore difficult to get them as the ma ma main mediators. That's where the AU and CMI play an important role. Why at the same time you do not uh, tell those countries that they should get out? They have to be remaining, but the AU in this particular case plays, and UN play a major role to facilitate dialogue between the parties to the conflict. This uh, um, one uh, point which I would like to uh, emphasize. The other point is um, the question of economic development. Mm -hmm. The economic development is very rapidly forgotten after the conflict has ceased. The case of Burundi. Uh, Burundi, uh, I would say, the, the socio-economic situation of Burundi as a landlocked country has been extremely important as a factor to the conflict. Mm. In many uh, situations, conflict is about power sharing and resources, sh resources sharing. And when you don't have resources to share, as is the case in Burundi, then the only thing re remaining is the state institution. The government is the main employer. And therefore, if uh, there is no development, there is no opportunities for population to grow. The situation is quite different in Central Africa Rep Republic. Central Africa Republic is a quite rich country with a lot of minerals. And in fact, one of the area, or major area of conflict is towards northeast of country where there are reserves of diamonds. So the parties to the conflict are fighting to control the resources of the country. This is happening also in South Sudan. How do we approach those situations? If you look at the 2005, uh, 2005 um, comprehensive agreement, peace agreement in South Sudan, uh, the, the agreement goes into details on how uh, petrol resources will be shared at local level, state level, and federal state level. Uh, these are critical points we have to look at if we have to mediate successfully conflict. I, I would say that uh, on election, I don't want to come uh, to comment on the election. I will come back later uh, during the, the debate. Thank you, sir. It, and, and this is a good point of departure. I'll turn to Ambassador Nuruddin Sati, uh, who was deeply involved in the Burundi process. Uh, and I already mentioned the, the, the role and organization of the elections. Could you speak to this fundamental question uh, around, and not to put a negative, but it's, it's a realist question, the consequences of democratic processes on peacemaking? Thank you very much, uh, Itondi. I am, I'm happy to be in uh, uh, Helsinki for the first time also. 
uh, and I hope it will not be the last time, as you said. Um, uh, well, uh, the issue of election, I think, is part of a wider uh, problem, because if we are talking about lessons learned uh, here, um, uh, from my own vantage view, uh, there are um, um, a lot of lessons that we can learn from conflict resolution in Africa. Uh, for me, uh, the first one is that we need to have a more comprehensive approach to conflict resolution. So far, we have had the piecemeal approach to conflict resolution. And here, I, I join my colleagues. And it's piecemeal because um, many of the actors come to conflict resolution from their own perspective, from own angle, their own vantage point. Uh, if you are in the humanitarian, you come with the point of view of a humanitarian actor. If you are in politics, you come from the perspective of a politician. If you are an economist, you come from the perspective of an economist. If you are, uh, for me, that's one reason why since I was ambassador in Paris in 1992, ambassador to UNESCO, one of the programs that I liked a lot and I continue to be engaged in until this moment Actually, UNESCO is celebrating the 25th anniversary of Castle Peace Program in Yamasukru uh, later this month. Uh, is that that idea gives a comprehensive approach to conflict resolution? It's about understanding the people. Uh, if you want to remember the people, you have to understand their history, you have to understand their culture, you have to understand their living conditions, where they are coming from, where they are going to, what are the, uh, the obstacles, uh, why are they fighting, uh, and. Uh, people do not only fight for one reason, they really fight for uh, a, a number. That's why uh, conflicts are, are so complex. Uh, and we have to face this complexity of, of, of conflict by having an overall, a comprehensive approach to mm. it. Uh, the cultural and historical, historical aspects are very important. Uh, what is happening now in the Middle East uh, and in some parts of Africa, the issue of uh, terrorism uh, slash jihad, uh, the issue of uh, uh, marginalization, which evolves in a, a question of jihadism and, and resistance uh, against the, uh, the Occidental or Western model, uh, is certainly a problem. Election, of course, are considered by many people are part and parcel of that Western model. Uh, in my own country, there are still people who say election is haram just like many other things. Uh, elections are unlawful because Sharia does not allow for election. Mm. Well, that's an example. Uh, and we are still well, struggling with this kind of concepts that have come from 14 centuries ago. Uh, and uh, people say, no, 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 we don't want election, we want Shura. Shura is a different concept, according to them. Because Shura is about uh, uh, having a, a a restrictive kind of consultation mm. among those who can decide what we call uh, Mr. Ambassador of Morocco, Ahl al Hal or Rabt, those who well, can decide for the others. Uh, so, uh, uh, but to respond to your question concerning the Burundi process and that matter, many of the other processes that we, we are dealing with, um, election uh, is, a, is a product of a long term process in the West. We know this fact. Uh, I, and I can contend that many of our countries are not yet ready for that kind of democracy. I can venture and say that. Because um, election is, I consider it as the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And I'm in a country where people understand what an iceberg is about. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but from my own culture, I would use maybe the metaphor of uh, uh, a sand dune, because I come from uh, uh, part of Sudan, where two miles away from, from the Nile, you have sand dunes. Uh, and uh, from the perspective of someone is at the top of sand, that sand dune can see uh, very far miles away. But before reaching that top, you have to make an effort to get there. So the elections uh, are being at the top of the sand dune without having done the necessary trip of getting to the top of the sand dune. Uh, so in the case of, of Burundi, um, our fear, even before concluding the, uh, the, the ceasefire agreement with the CNDD and, and, and the, later on uh, the, uh, 
um, the FNL, our uh, wildest fear was the, to avoid what we call uh, generally uh, the phenomena of winner takeover. Because, and this is exactly what happened in, in Burundi, unfortunately. We are organizing the election, we help them, and the uh, CNDDFD, they have won the elections, and the first thing they do, they have used that election, used that uh, uh, position in order to, to ostracize and isolate and uh, see to it that nobody uh, you know, wins the next uh, election apart from, from them. This is a, a, a critical, critical point in terms of shifting the narrative from a, a, a winner takes all. But I, I don't want to lose sight of your initial comments, sir, regarding the, the, the cultural conflicts, not just relativism, mm -hmm. but, but, but serious challenge in translation and appreciation for historical uh, depth in terms of heritage. And I, I take note that your comments are said not only as a CMI advisor, but as current chairman of Sudan's National Library, uh, in, in which capacity you have responsibility to preserve uh, and to uphold that legacy in Sudan. Colonel Mbai, towards the end of Ambassador Sate's comments, he referenced the, 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 the challenge of elections with regards to peace and, and, and the context in Burundi whereby there is this notion of a winner takes all. And he specifically referenced movements, rebel movements whom I know, uh, you, you may not say uh, so much, but whom I know you are familiar with. Uh, if you could reflect upon the lessons you have derived, this critical issue, transition from rebel movement to political organization not just responsible for yourself, but now assuming authority and responsibility for the nation. Can you talk about the lessons you've derived on that process itself? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, to go swiftly, I would uh, say that, uh, let me please uh, refer to Karl von Clausewitz, war as continuation of politics with adjunction of uh, other means. <laughs> and uh, this has been kind of uh, translated by uh, Lenin, war as a continuation of politics, and Mao Zedong, war uh, uh, is politics. Uh, is, uh, politics is war without uh, effusion of blood. When you get into that, uh, what do you see on the ground? I was privileged uh, already in 1972, as pointed out by one of my colleagues here, to uh, be supportive uh, as a young lieutenant of the uh, PIJC war against uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, that was, uh, and then uh, war the uh, PIJC. Uh, it is PIJC is uh, I think everybody knows PIJC of Guinea-Bissau. It was war against Portugal for uh, liberation of uh, their country, and uh, you, you maybe know uh, America Cabral. Otherwise, we'll talk about that uh, later. On. Uh, during uh, that war, I think uh, we realized, and uh, this has been also uh, replicated everywhere, that we have political parties and movement, and their transformation is very delicate. How to separate both of them? And this happened in every everywhere indeed. Uh, here I see, I am in Hotel Rivoli, which reminds me of Napoleon, and uh, Prince Bernadotte, etc., etc., and uh, it, it is important that uh, whenever you see the political leadership uh, become or be already the military, you have frictions. What Klaus Witt ca ca characterized as frictions in politics and war simultaneously, which is the confusion of the political goal and the, the military objectives very often. Uh, I think uh, Hitler did the same thing from 1992 when he became what they called the uh, Oberführungskommando der Wehrmacht, uh, commander-in-chief. And then uh, in Stalingrad, uh, he, he, he made a war that was uh, more political than uh, military. And what do we talk about? A system, political, military. Political military movement transforming uh, into political and military is indeed uh, something that needs to be addressed properly. If not addressed properly, you have a lot of problems. I think in Burundi we succeeded a lot because there had been a, not only the uh, poverty reduction strategy that was uh, uh, put in place, which is uh, <laughs> not very ambitious, it is reduction of poverty only, 
Uh, but there was a, a peace consolidation strategy in parallel, which uh, is, uh, I think at some stages, uh, your country shared the configuration on Burundi, as well as uh, uh, also uh, Norway and uh, Switzerland successively. And uh, this was important because uh, this was real follow-up at all the dimensions, including with, uh, within a tracking system and a very, uh, very uh, flexible fundings towards resolving problems as they come up. And with that respect, uh, I think uh, with international support, there could be a proper kind of uh, seminars, not only to disarm people, but to disarm the mentalities. And this uh, was done through a number of uh, uh, good colleagues, excellent colleagues like uh, Ambassador Wolpe and his, uh, you remember, uh, Ambassador Sati and others, to diffuse the mentality. Because if you don't disarm them mentally, you, have, you will have problems. And uh, in mm. some cases, uh, there are still uh, in Guinea-Bissau, for example, Mariama, people I knew during the War of Liberation were still there, and uh, they continue to be called the Colonel, General, and uh, Mr. Minister. In the same time, you see the confusion. The same applies in uh, Central African Republic, where I have been in 2010 uh, to support uh, within the UN when I was in the standby team of mediation. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, the problematic is there. Solutions should be there. And uh, we are doing our best uh, uh, in support of the UN or with the UN uh, oftentimes the, when uh, they ask uh, so that uh, we can, uh, in the cessation of hostilities or ceasefire agreements, which are quite different uh, because the second one is more comprehensive and has <coughs> political and other uh, implications, including uh, political and uh, social outcomes for those combatants. Not only say you signed it and then you have to respect it. So uh, these are the, the problems I think that are behind. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Before we open for questions, I, I, I will turn to Ambassador Kapia. And, and here I would, would like to emphasize the, the recent and current role you have on the Eastern DRC process on behalf of the region as well as the United Nations. Um, and if you could speak to the challenge of follow-up mechanisms vis-a-vis uh, -vis peace processes. I, I'm familiar with one uh, movement as it stands that, that literally names itself after an agreement that wasn't followed up on, uh, that I know uh, your, you yourself, um, uh, President Kappa, President Abbasanjo, General Sumbeo, uh, advanced. Uh, if you could reflect upon follow-up mechanisms, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Tonde, um, Honorable Minister, Honorable Secretary of State, um, Madam CEO, Excellencies Resident Ambassadors. Um, let me say that I'm very comforted by what I've just heard, especially from the, um, the Finnish authorities. We are in Finland, or oh, there is Finland, and um, there is President Mati Atisari. Uh, as Mr. Bakira said, these two are extraordinary entities. Um, extraordinary country, Finland, extraordinary personality, President Mati Atisari. And um, CMY is linked to these two. Um, there's a strong legacy which CMY cannot shake off. I'm, I'm saying this because um, as we've been brainstorming, uh, we get to a point whereby we say, how far can we go? Because uh, we all know that uh, peacemaking in itself is expensive. Uh, if, if you have to make peace, then you are talking about resources. Um, all doors are being opened, especially in Africa. Uh, everywhere we knock, the doors are opened uh, immediately when you say of oh, Finland and when you mention the name of President Matatisat, for simple reasons that these are good, are good entities. You know, pe people are not scared. Um, 
if you mention the, the, the big names, that all oh, we are coming, you know, we are an NGO from the, we, we have to be careful. So we need to reflect more. Um, and we all believe that CMI can make the difference. But in those reflections, we will just have to see how far we can go. Um, Follow-up mechanisms. The DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, since 1960, has been up and down, up and down, conflict after conflict, resolution after resolution. I remember in 2008, when um, President, Ob former Nigerian President General Olusegun Obasanjo was nominated by the Secretary General to be his special envoy, and former Tanzanian President Benjamin Mkapa was nominated by the AU and the region to be the special envoy, I was part of the team. So we went to Kinshasa, and uh, General Obasanjo told President Kabila, who is also a general, Mm -hmm. but a younger one. I told him, General, when I was a lieutenant in the Nigerian Army in 1960, I came here with the UN forces. Now, 50 years on, I'm, I'm coming here as a retired general and as a retired head of state twice in Nigeria to talk about the same issue. Hmm. What is the problem? The younger general looked at the older general and just smiled. Uh, the follow-up mechanisms. So these two gentlemen, President Obasanjo, President Mkapa, worked for two years and got to the day when the agreements in Goma were signed. This is March 2009. Mm. Beautiful agreement signed, and we all left. I can tell you, because I was part of the follow-up follow -up teams with General Sumbeyo, we went to Kinshasa. We, we get to Kinshasa for three days. The minister is nowhere to be seen. We fly to Goma. We go to Goma. The national follow-up mechanism is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Definitely, there must be a problem. And if nothing is implemented, then you have a renaissance of the M23, which is, which is a new rebellion. They said, now we go back to the Goma agreements, and we rebel and we start afresh. So. Um, I will go back to Mozambique, because that, I think, was the best example of Mozambique. After the agreement was signed, there was proper follow-up mechanisms, and Aldo Aiello, and the Italian statesman, made sure that the agreement was implemented to the latent spirit. And Mozambique is there, I think, over 20 years, though they started recently, but I think for more than 20 years there was some peace. So um, this is one of the key issues we should look at. Once we, the agreements are signed, how far should we go? How long should we remain engaged? Thank you. Thank you, sir. We now open the floor for questions. We have approximately uh, 25 minutes for questions uh, and comments from the floor. I have several more, so if hands do not raise, trust me, I'll, I'll ask. I see, I see one here. Uh, thank you for assisting. Uh, any others? Thank you, madam. Uh, gentleman here in the center. We, we would uh, encourage a conversational approach, but also bearing in mind that there are more than uh, one individual in the room. So brevity is welcome. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the very <coughs> inspiring panel and a very distinguished panelist. My name is Perti Antinen. I'm now, actually, my first day at the Africa Department of Foreign Affairs. I just come back from Zambia. Uh, I ended my tour as an ambassador, uh, Finnish ambassador in Lusaka, also covering Malawi and Zimbabwe. Mm. And actually, my comment is derived from that my experience there. And I'm very happy to hear Honorable Minister mentioning that Africa has also success stories, and uh, I would say that the success story is, is, is at, the, at the moment, is the whole Southern African region. And even, even let's say, SADC Plus, um, I think there's a remarkable uh, progress there in terms of consolidating peace in the area, also consolidating the economic growth, and uh, Zambia is a very good example of that. And uh, 
I just want to pick up a few things which I think are very important there, and uh, I think uh, Ambassador Bouakira mentioned the role of neighboring countries and uh, external actors that can be very destructive. And uh, we know the history of South African region, the SADC region. There was one actor which was very much destabilizing other countries. And when that, that country, South Africa, uh, became democratic uh, nation again, um, the whole scene actually changed a lot. And I think one of the reasons for success story in South Africa is that there are no external actors as such, these stabilizing as, as we can see in, in other parts of, some other parts of Africa. <clears throat> but I think one issue is what I think um, is there still, there's still a uh, dimension of degree of fragility built in the societies, even in South Africa. We've seen that in, in Mozambique, as recently mentioned, just, and, and others even less so than now. Uh, um, and we have to keep an eye on that also. And, and therefore, I think sometimes EU is a bit too much driven by conflicts. You know, our foreign agenda is full of conflicts. But if you sometimes forget that we have to be also present and very involved in the countries but have enjoying the relative stability, including Zambia. Uh, elections were mentioned, and I have to say that um, I'm very glad to be in Zambia when the peaceful elections were held in 2011, resulting in chains of powers, which is very important. So people have a feeling that through voting, they can actually change leaders in the country. Same in Malawi, less so in Zimbabwe, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, one of the big issues is that the mentality of winner take, winner take it all. I think it's very important to to, to, to maintain, maintain the a spirit of democracy in all, all areas, in, even in the countries like such as Zambia and Malawi and others. And my last point actually is, which uh, Mr. Champentier uh, brought up, is the social economic diamonds. And I think inequality is one of the biggest uh, threats to, 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 to peace, even in the Southern African region. I think the economic growth which has been very rapid, very, very solid in, in Zambia and others. If the inequality dimension grows too much, I think that may be one of the issues that may destabilize and may put the peace and jeopardy in the whole region. So, thank you. Particularly in South Africa. <laughs> South <laughs> Africa and the region. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Madam Ren, if you would, in the front here. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Rehn, and uh, I have done a lot with uh, both peace mediation and peacekeeping and peace whatever. Uh, for the moment, and my questions will be a couple of them around what I'm doing just now. Uh, I'm a, a member of the board of the Trust Fund for Victims at the International Criminal Court on my way mm -hmm next Sunday to Johannesburg for a conference where ICC meets Africa. That will be quite tense, I will talk, for putting the victims in the focus. Mm. And, um, and there, of course, uh, my first question comes, and that is justice. Mm. Do we, can we have peace without justice? Or is it so that justice is hindering the peace? We all know that in the negotiations that can be a very difficult part to get, uh, to take away the impunity for people who don't sign the agreement when they know that they will uh, end up in, in ICC courtrooms or somewhere mm -hmm. else. My second duty today is what has been all through my, my life is, of course, the fight for, for the equality. I think you didn't talk about equality between women and men, uh, but uh, it's quite important. Um, Twelve years ago, it was presented in, in the United Nations in Security Council by Kofi Annan, a study, a report, that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and I did about 1325. And now um, UN Women 
uh, Under Secretary General has asked me to join uh, for a new update study, uh, a so called high level uh, expert advisory group. So, how much are you influenced? Of course, it's a little bit difficult to ask that from you in the panel, as you happen all to be men. But um, and some of some of them older men as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, but I hope really that you understand how important this is. That building up, uh, you came, George, quite close to this when you asked for the uh, socio-economic uh, dimension. And I always almost waited that you will mention, especially to get the women involved and, and have their role in building up the society. And uh, how much do you really think about that uh, in the work when there is not the, uh, the, some kind of meeting that you, when you have to say that women are very important? for this work. And then when you really work, you forget them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. On, on two questions raised and then a, a comment uh, from the former ambassador to, to Zambia. On, on the first uh, question regarding uh, essentially questions around impunity and justice, I'll, I'll ask Ambassador Sati to comment on this. On, on the second question regarding uh, areas of inclusivity, I'll ask Ambassador Bwakira to, to point to this uh, as it was raised in the context of the CAR process, which, which under the uh, framework of CMI's work with the AU, we are directly supporting, and you're serving on the, one of the commissions. Briefly, with regards to questions of impunity, and it's interesting that uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was referenced, I, I happen to serve as a report writer for Liberia's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I recall a discussion with the Executive Secretary of the Commission when asking him why, knowing that you would jeopardize the stability of the country, why in the final report would the commission recommend uh, punitive measures for the sitting head of state, a sitting Supreme Court uh, justice, who was the spokesperson for rebel movement, as well as other officials, including senators, etc. And the response was one I won't forget, namely he said that they understood that the root causes of, of Liberia's cyclical violence was a culture of impunity. So even if it meant risking immediate instability, they would attempt to put in measures that establish some kind of rule of law. Whether those recommendations were helpful is, is another question, but, but that was his response, which I found to be uh, a critique of my own position in this regard. Ambassador Sati, this question of impunity came up in your own experience in Burundi. I don't if you care to reflect upon this briefly. Uh. Well, uh, it came in Burundi from uh, maybe a slightly di different perspective. But let me uh, say that uh, when the Arusha Agreement, uh, Burundi was signed in 2000, uh, there was a provision uh, for uh, an international uh, committee of inquiry, committee of inquiry and uh, a tribunal. It started as an international one, then it ended as a mixed one. But those two have not been done so far. Uh, 2000, this is 2014, 14 years. For the simple reason, nor the government, nor the former rebels wanted this to happen. Because they both, uh, well, have their, when we were in Burundi, we know that every day we were shaking hands with people who have blood in their hands. Uh, this is a case in Sudan. The CPA in Sudan was signed in 2005, and the government and the SPLM uh, at that time decided not to have any mention of justice. Hmm. Uh, this is a big gap, actually, in that agreement. In the Darfur agreements, we have mentioned, so we have many agreements where uh, the two have an arrangement so that they will not. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, uh, this has been, for me, actually, from my own experience, a very difficult question to, uh, to answer. Uh, and within the UN itself, there is a tug of war, as you know, between the political department on one side and the legal department. And I found myself trapped between the two. In 2006, when we had to sign that agreement with the FNL uh, in Dar es Salaam, uh, his own country. 
we had all the heads of state of the region aligned there waiting for to sign the agreement with the FNL. And I was representing the UN. And then I received a message from New York, do not sign that agreement. Why? Because there was the word pardon in it for the three you know, major crimes that you know. And the presidents were there already. They were entering the room and preparing the documents and the pens and all that to sign. And then my chair was there. So um, what did I do? I said, if I do not sign, I will be fired by the heads of state. If I sign, I'll be fired by the Secretary, of, uh, of the, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Maybe then the heads of state will talk about me and say, well, he has done the good thing, then they'll, I'll be back. But no, what I have done, actually, I asked the mediator, the minister of, of, uh, of uh, 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 South Africa, uh, Charles Ngakula, who was representing uh, Zuba at that time, Mbeki, actually. And uh, I said, uh, Charles, um, I'm going to do something. I give you a letter that. Uh, uh, the UN has reservations on that clause, particularly on when there is pardon. You answer me, you say you have taken note of this reservation. We have done that, and then I signed that agreement. But this uh, conundrum continues until this day. If you want my own opinion, uh, if you, it is part and parcel of that comprehensive approach that I spoke about. You have to have a comprehensive approach, the socio-cultural one, the economic one, the, the peace uh, part of it and the justice part of it. Accountability. And accountability has to be there. Uh, it is true that justice uh, delayed is justice denied, but there are certain um, positions where if you insist that justice be done today, then there will never be peace. Because those who are carrying the arms will resist you and will continue. Perhaps the Sudan appointed case. Uh, uh, the Sudan case United today, United. our own president, as you yeah, know, is the ICC and uh, uh, and there is actually a debate in Sudan whether uh, that president, if he's taken away today, whether there's going to be chaos in Sudan or not. Maybe this is, uh, well, I, it's a very difficult question to answer. But these are some of the reflections that we need to talk, talk on board. Ambassador Bakira, in, on behalf of CMI, you have been, you were at the Brazzaville Forum uh, review and drafting the, the, the commission on ceasefire, uh, cessation of hostilities, excuse me. Uh, this question of inclusivity is constantly coming up in Central African Republic. Can you speak to the importance of this, uh, not only from uh, a gender perspective as such, uh, which is part and parcel, but from a broad lens of what is inclusivity? Thank you. Um, in the case of uh, Central African Republic, <coughs> I would say that uh, the question of inclusivity was indeed in the minds of the contact group, international contact group, uh, because the documents which we were uh, considering in Brazzaville were first prepared by parties to the conflict in Bangui before they came to Brazzaville. At, uh, at that point, all elements, political elements, military elements, women, uh, trade unions, were all invited. Uh, however, the ex seleka did not participate in the discussions in Bangui because they were in Benin uh, in a consultation with uh, the former Prime Minister Jotodia. But I can say that the international contact group was satisfied that everybody who had to be consulted had to be has been consulted. There are elements of uh, foreign, uh, I mean, uh, Central African citizen outside in diaspora who were not involved, and those came in Brazzaville, and the prime minister, who happened to be in Brazzaville himself, agreed to add them on the list. So I think on the on that side, one can say the, the, the process was fully inclusive. Mm. We'll take more questions from the floor. Yes, on the left here. Uh, uh, hello, 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Tapia Rantanen. I work as a desk officer for mediation and women, peace and security here in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, I would like to uh, present to the uh, distinguished panelists and the audience one uh, very short advertisement, uh, one uh, uh, point and one uh, question. The advertisement part is to introduce Ms. Laura Tulia Lehtinen as the new uh, national coordinator for mediation within the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, she has uh, just uh, begun her, her term here uh, and will be a uh, very uh, instrumental uh, partner for uh, all colleagues here in the Ministry and in Finland and, and indeed to our international partners as well. Uh, my point is that the, that I wanted to uh, introduce is that the UN General Assembly approved uh, unanimously in, in July this year the third UN resolution on mediation introduced by Finland and Turkey. And uh, while, not, while I don't want to overplay its direct significance to, in the field of mediation, I would like to invite uh, everyone to think and or perhaps comment on uh, on the res new resolution as a giving a as clear and unequivocal mandate as you can you can get from the United Nations for strengthening and intensifying uh, cooperation between the UN between and regional and sub-regional actors and other actors in in the field and I think uh, that's uh, also something I want to want to ask from the panelists with their uh, immense experience and it's uh, what is the role of cooperation between different partly cooperative, partly competitive actors such as states, international organizations, regional organizations and uh, civil society organizations. What's, the, what's their uh, adept uh, division of labor and how could we uh, improve it and could we use the new resolution partly at, at least as giving mandate and some uh, elements to, to cooperation. Thank you. Very important point in question, and thank you for the, the announcement. Another question from the floor, Ambassador, if you would. Yes. There's a microphone coming. Thank you, Mr. Kakuma. Thanks to the panelists for such a rich and comprehensive uh, presentation on this particular very sensitive issue for mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, jumping on maybe on the last point or regional actors and uh, some specific initiatives like Turkey and uh, Finland mediation initiative. Uh, maybe you're aware that uh, my country, Morocco, has also initiated a similar uh, initiative with mm. Spain. And in both cases, I would guess or argue that you have an actor from the EU and an actor from outside the EU with specific, I would say, even more deeply comprehension of regional mm. complexities and elements. In the case of Turkey, with regards to Central Asia, Middle East, and some parts even of uh, European uh, geographic proximity. Mm. In the case of Morocco, I don't need to emphasize its historic uh, role you know, in, in Africa mm. as a, a historical African partner, but also as the closest mm. partner to the EU outside the EU members. Mm. So uh, don't we need actually to see more coordination and cooperation between those two entities in particular and similar actors in general? That's one question. The other question relates to Another equally important uh, aspect, and that's related to some mechanisms of peace building and peacemaking and mediation, mm. and that's what Ambassador Nordin developed in his uh, presentation with regards to a comprehensive approach, mm. and I thank him for underlying specifically the cultural aspect. Uh, we know that so many conflicts around the world today, specifically in Africa, but also in our part of the world, because uh, if I speak of Morocco, we're also part of the Arab world. And uh, I think <coughs> most of those uh, 
conflicts today, unfortunately, are underlined or motivated by some cultural or religious, I would say, or ideological mm -hmm. aspects. And needs the, this needs to be taken into account. I would like just to mention here as you know, as a, a, a thought maybe to share with and an information to share that some of you might be aware of that there is this new uh, aspect of uh, spiritual security or spiritual mm -hmm. dimension that needs to be taken into account. And my country particularly is working here uh, very, uh, I mean, it's taking this, this issue very seriously and we are already partners with so many uh, African brothers, uh, mm. specifically Mali and other Western countries mm. that are uh, the case of Central Africa has been mentioned here. Mm. And uh, so uh, we are forming what uh, we call imams or predicators in so many uh, African countries and uh, including some North African countries, mm. basically Tunisia and Libya. And uh, this, 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 this aspect is, uh, may look or sound uh, a rather side aspect of any given conflict, but I think it's essential yeah. Yeah, to be taken. And uh, on the economic dimension and social dimension, I think that Morocco also is one of the countries that is given an example, I would say or argue with, uh, together with South Africa, where are both uh, the main investors in, in Africa. Mm. And this is significantly very, very important. Uh, I think South, South Africa in the southern uh, part or southern hemisphere and Morocco specifically in Western and North and uh, Western African countries, we are basically on the ground. I mean, more of our mm. top 100 companies are in the ground working. On the social side also, Morocco is working heavily. And I think this is something that also uh, should be taken into account specifically by the African actors themselves, but also from the uh, outside world. So uh, these are a few thoughts that I just uh, wanted to share with the panelists uh, throughout for discussion. And I would love to hear your comments on that. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you, sir. George, you began the discussion, and you'll, you'll be uh, somehow st stimulating the conclusion of it now. Um, if you can reflect upon this, this question raised by our colleague here uh, on the importance or significance of the resolution as put forth by Turkey and Finland as a part of your, your final uh, remarks. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, um, and I, will, I would like to make a comment also on, on, on this last point. In, on let us very short. We'll, we'll come back to you on that if time permits. Okay, very okay. well. But on the UN, secu on the Security Council uh, resolution, of course, I think what is, um, I would say, on mediation, what is um, important there is that it is an initiative that comes from Finland and Turkey mm. more than the content of the resolution itself. I think that kind of engagement from such diverse uh, and, let's say, um, trusted mm. uh, partners mm. is, is, is what gives that resolution uh, way. Uh, we know how much mm. Security Council and General Assembly decision, resolutions and decisions, mm. you know, uh, 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 how much impact or lack of impact they can have. Um, very recent, I would just refer very recently to an address by uh, Nabi Pillar, the, the outgoing yes, um, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, on the failure of uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the Security Council uh, mechanism as you know, as, as, a, as an ultimate resort to bring in peace and, 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 and finish it. You know, by you know. I, thank you. Colonel, if you could speak in your concluding comments to the significance or importance of coordination and cooperation, as has been raised by at least two individuals from the floor. I think it's very badly needed. Uh, the last uh, one example to illustrate that, uh, the uh, ceasefire agreement between MNLA uh, mm -hmm. and High Council for uh, Azawad and uh, the government of Mali. 
number of uh, signatories. You find there the regional mediator, which was Burkina Faso, and then the co-mediator of the same region, which was uh, Nigeria, and then uh, European Union uh, with uh, their Sahel concept. And then uh, you, you find also uh, organization of Islamic countries mm -hmm. that came to sign, Switzerland, because they funded partially, and then European Union, they funded a lot, etc., etc. And uh, all these people were talking separately, uh, not to mention African Union, of course, where President Buyoya was representing us. We in CMI, we were supporting uh, the, uh, the UN on that occasion, and uh, we are uh, drafting the ceasefire agreement. That was signed by so many people that uh, I think <coughs> it lost uh, kind of substance, mm. and it was disorganized, not implementable. Um, Ambassador Bwakira, Ambassador Kapia, Ambassador Sati, between you, <laughs> we'll share four minutes <laughs> uh, as concluding remarks. So any key highlights you want to raise, I, I would remind you of a significant issue raised in the end on spiritual security, as it were. Uh, I suspect Ambassador Sati will touch on this. Ambassador Bwakira. Well, I will be very brief. Uh, I have not seen the uh, UN General Assembly resolution. However, uh, one dimension which uh, has been uh, uh, mentioned in several occasions by Secretary General is the need for partnership between the United Nations, regional organization, and civil society. So, that, I mean, the, the, the mistrust mentioned by George can be overcome by bringing everybody on board. And I would say that in the case, particular case of Central Africa Republic, in Brazzaville, it was touching to see that the imam mm. and the bishop were together at the same time signing the agreement on cessation of hostilities. So that dimension seemed to have been captured mm. by those who prepared the, 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 the agreement. Ambassador Kapia, concluding uh, remark in the singular. <laughs> remark. <laughs> no, uh, the concluding remark will be by you as head. Uh, me, I want to, I want to thank Elizabeth uh, for emphasizing the role of women. Hmm. I remember in 1999 we were sitting in Arusha uh, on the Burundi peace process, which was being moderated by the late President Nyerere. And uh, one evening, he was invited to a reception to commemorate the 37th anniversary passing of Prince Ruagasore of Burundi. So we went there, and the president asked, where are the women? Hmm. Where are the women in this peace process? So at the next sitting, the women came, and that made a lot of difference in order to, uh, to, hmm. to, yeah, to, to attain the, the final touches of the peace agreement. So that's a very good point. Um, on the economic and social dimension aspects uh, of mediation, all these are important elements. We are not talking about a Marshall Plan, mm. but what we are talking about is to see that uh, once the agreements are signed and these people now are left on their own <laughs> to move, uh, it's like a child who starts to walk if you don't hold the hand, it will fall down. Mm. Yeah, so all these elements should be well, well uh, borne in mind. The case of South Sudan. Thank you. Ambassador Sati, you have 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Sudanese time. My four, my, my four, yeah, well, I happen. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to be a Sudanese, so I, I can take two minutes. Uh, no, well, uh, my former director general at UNESCO, Federico Mayor, uh, used to say there are two ways of, of, of thanking people, mm. uh, a short way and a long way. The short way is thank you. The long way is thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, but I, I'll touch very quickly on the issue of regional, um, um, very quickly. Uh, I, I always believe that uh, cooperation between uh, external and regional and national actors is very important. Mm -hmm. It can make or break, uh, especially external actors. 
uh, in many conflicts around the world, if the external actors who have the power do not align their policies and their approaches to conflict, there will be no peace. Mm. For sure, there will be no peace. Uh, and the second point is that we need to align or reconcile our perceptions about what's happening in a given conflict. If we do not do that, these perceptions are spiritual, they are intellectual, they are cultural, they are economic, they are social, they are human, they are uh, behavioral, etc., etc. So if this is not reconciled in, in a certain way, that's why I'm talking about this global uh, approach to the issues of conflict and avoid this piecemeal approach. There is a structural issue, a structural issue that need to deal with, but there is also a kind of uh, an intellectual one about uh, the perceptions that we need to. Spiritual, uh, I think, peacekeeping, uh, peacemaking is very important, especially today. Uh, as a UNESCO man, uh, we have been saying this, Mr. Ambassador, for the last 25, 30 years, mm. that do not forget that not all people have their own approach to spiritual issues. Uh, some people will believe in it, some people will not believe in it. But we should not assume that since you do not believe it, that everybody else should be the same thing. There are some people in this world who take this very seriously, the issue of religion, for example. And we have seen the result of what's happening now in my own country. Uh, uh, well, Islamic Sharia was introduced as early as 1989, uh, 83 actually, and now we see uh, that is spreading. And we'd like just last word to go back to what the minister was saying. Mm. Uh, neglected or forgotten conflicts prepare the ground for the future world. Yes. Mm. Uh, I am thinking about Sudan and South Sudan. We mishandle it completely, and now everybody wants to have his own and their own. And yet, in fact, the issues are known, but not, uh, issues are not known. We are being, They are not digested uh, you know, sufficiently. Let us see how we can, as we say, follow through and, and to see to it that these uh, issues are resolved once and for all. And we need to go to the root causes, not to gloss over issues as we are doing now. Thank you, sir. A very fine note to end on. Apologies to our colleagues in the back uh, as, as time has ended, but I'm sure conversation can continue. We're over one minute, so forgive me. Thank you. Some of us were privileged last night to participate, I wouldn't say even attend, uh, an extremely powerful uh, concert. We agree to disagree at Music Key Kitaro. Is this correct? Music Kitaro. Next to Finlandia Hall. And in many ways, I think this conversation was a continuity of that performance. Uh, hearing these reflections on decades of peacemaking, not just in the past, but currently uh, with uh, CMI. We thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We thank uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and our colleagues at CMC for the opportunity to share some of those reflections which we anticipate will continue. Thank you very much, as UNESCO says.